Hi, Martin. Hello. I can see Opera House behind there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and hopefully All right. Going Great. This one. All right. I'll leave the stage and leave it to you. Enjoy. Thank you. Um, so welcome, everyone. My name is Martin, and I work as a software developer at Atlassian. And today, I'd like to talk about a strangling the monolith. And we strangled the monolith with a service that was actually a reactive GraphQL gateway. So when I'm talking about strangling the monolith, um, first, I need to tell you which monolith I'm uh, talking about. I work on a product called Jira Software. And the encyclopedia definition is that it's a tool to plan, track, and release software. And if you have worked with Jira, you know it's an issue tracking system. And Jira software are the agile tools on top of it, like boards, backlogs, sprints. But for this, it's more interesting to look at what Jira software is from developer's perspective. And for that, I'll make a little trip to the past. So Jira was first released in 2002 as an on-premises product. It was a Java application that you could just run yourself in your own application server. And the first cloud version was exactly the same, using the same code base, just deployed in our own data center. You can imagine that was not very sustainable because we had to deploy for each customer their own Linux server and maintain it. So these requirements in cloud and server were very different. In 2016, because of these reasons, Atlassians decided to fork the code. And that's how Jira Cloud and Jira Software Cloud came to be. And that's how we inherited this monolith legacy. And on this code base, there were teams of developers working together, the Jira Software developers with others. And as the code base grew and the number of developers grew as well, the overall happiness of those developers kind of decreased. And the bigger the code base grew and the more developers joined, the worse it was. And if we didn't stop there, I think something like this would happen. So we didn't want that to happen. And we looked at the code base. And instead, we identified pieces of Jira software that didn't have to live in the monolith. And we started a process that we call decomposition or extraction from the monolith. Now, that sounds simple. So what we're doing is we just split the monolith. We take a piece of the code, put it in a microservice, and then another microservice and another microservice. And because developers can now work on a limited code base and they control um, the service and they can't, can own the service, it makes them uh, much happier again. To, uh, to accelerate this process, Atlassian created a platform to help developers build, deploy, and run services. And we call it Micros. It's no magic. It's just very carefully curated tech stack and a lot of automation. So what we do is we write our service, we put it in a Docker container, give it a little descriptor, and then the platform will take care of deploying the service into AWS and provisioning all the resources. Now, it also adds some monitoring on top of it to help us run the service by the philosophy, you build it, you run it. As I said, we just need a little descriptor. I'm telling the platform, this is the name of my service. I want you to expose this port to the internet, 8080. Um, I want um, to have DynamoDB as my resource. And also, here is my health check. So if my node uh, doesn't respond to this health check, please provision me a new node. Again, you can put anything in the container, in the Docker container. But uh, at Atlassian, the teams are pretty big, and they have to have some kind of agreement. We call these tech stacks, of course. And the current Jira software tech stack looks like this. We use Kotlin for all new services, Spring Boot as the application framework, DynamoDB or Postgres for databases, and Project Reactor for um, reactive applications. And here is a case for a real application that we have built for a very specific use case, which is the extraction from the monolith. So imagine a very typical front-end application hitting different endpoints or services. You can imagine that as you extract services, you get more and more of these services. And on top of processing time inside those services, you also get latency between the front end, the application running in a customer's computer, and the data center. And you cannot really do much about it because that's simply the distance and the infrastructure between. So what you can do is think about your architecture. Because 
you can argue that you can make these calls in parallel, but sometimes you cannot, right? You have to get an ID from one source and then you have to ask another service for the actual object. But when I'm talking about changing architecture, one of the options you have is use an API gateway. And that's what we did. So you still have to call the data center once, but then if you are smart, you can make all the other calls within the data center. And these are, of course, very quick. Another thing that this gateway can help you with the specific use case of strengthening the monolith is that it completely abstracts the front end from the changes in the back end. The front end will always talk only to the gateway. And it doesn't matter to the front end whether the gateway talks to the legacy code or to your modern microservices. And you can slowly start migrating the legacy into the microservices. So you have a gateway. We call this the strangler pattern. That's where the name of the talk comes from, which is the isolation of the front end from the back end. You can also add things like dark traffic when you simply call both places. Um, you only use the monolith or you only use the microservice, but you do comparisons. So you make sure that you are still providing the same data. A very important thing for these gateways is that you should keep the business logic to minimum. It's not always possible to have no business logic because sometimes you have no place to put that business logic. But if you can keep it as a completely no code, just configuration, that would be great. And of course, you want to make these gateways fully stateless um, so you can make you can scale them almost indefinitely. It's obvious that such a gateway need to be asynchronous because what it does is it gets a request it calls a bunch of other services and then just waits for replies, responses, and then sends a response. So most of the time, it actually does nothing because there's significant time where the uh, communication takes significant time. So asynchronous is a perfect fit. And from all the asynchronous frameworks, we picked Project Reactor. It has a very useful set of operators that help us modify and combine different sources and allow combinations, a composition of different libraries that, for example, add resilience and, tra and, and tracing. It also creates functional style, kind of clean code that we tend to like um, without this callback hell that you can get into if you use, for example, completable futures from Java. Of course, it's not all that simple because the reactive programming comes with a paradigm shift. You have to change the way you are thinking. And that is not simple. And you have to invest in, um, in developer's knowledge unless you already have a team that knows reactive programming. If you've never heard about reactive streams, I'm just going to quickly introduce two things here, two things that we call publishers. So in, in reactive streams, you have publishers that publish some data and subscribers that consume the data. First of those publishers is say mono, which is a stream of zero to, an, uh, zero to one items. I just have a uh, Kotlin example that in Kotlin, you can make anything into a mono. And another term is a flux which is a stream of 0 to n items. And again, um, you can turn anything, an iterable, a list, or another stream into a flux. Now, I was talking about composition. So what I'm doing here, I have a, a stream of the current board. That's just one that I'm right, visiting right now in Jira, for example. And then I have a list of recent board IDs um, that I have visited in the past. And my use case is that I want to print, for example, the three last boards I have visited. So I'm going to concatenate these two streams and get a new publisher. Um, in reactive programming, you create a calculation like this, that current board concatenate with the recent boards. Then you map this ID, each value, into its name. And then you take three items. And once you subscribe to, subscribe to it, you can, for example, print it. And this is how it would look like. Now, I was talking also about operators. You can easily add things like timeout. So this is a not a very important functionality. Let's say that this board service can take long. So if it doesn't return a name in two and a half seconds, I'm just going to print a placeholder string. And I will get something like this back. Now, this was an artificial example. In reality, you would do something like this. Instead of having static uh, lists and values, you probably have different services providing you these data, this data. So the current board comes from one service, and it can be a different microservice, and recent boards from another service. And when I create this calculation and pass it to somebody else, when they subscribe to it, these two services are actually, actually executed at the same time. And 
when the result comes, they are combined into this new stream. So this is how you get very cheap parallelism from reactive streams. And this is what we are using a lot because for one request, we are calling different services and then combining these streams. Another thing that we picked was GraphQL. What I liked about GraphQL, which is the query language, um, that it has a strongly typed schema. That means that it is safer and it also works as a living documentation that doesn't get out of sync with your code, like REST APIs can sometimes do. Like you generate, uh, you, you create your swagger, you generate your code, and then when you need to make changes, it's kind of hard to keep that in sync. But in GraphQL, it's easier because if you make change in one and you do not make change anywhere else, it just doesn't work. It also helps you uh, to get exactly what you want because uh, you can query multiple sources at once without even knowing it, and you can specify only what you want to get back. There are also mature web clients like Apollo and Relay that helped us simplify our frontends significantly. This is an example GraphQL schema that is very similar to what we in Geo Software actually use. So there is a query that allows me to query for boards by ID, and a board is a simple object that has a name and a list of issues. And an issue is, again, simple object that has an ID and a string. And let's say I want to get a board by ID 42, and I only want its name and issues, and I'm not interested in any IDs. And this is what I get back, right? It's a very simple JSON object, like you would expect from any other API. But what you don't know is that this name and the issues come from different endpoints or maybe even different microservices. But you don't care, right? You just wanted the whole, this, this whole object. So we picked Project Reactor and GraphQL Java, and it worked well for us. But there is, is a word of warning. Whenever you use a reactive stream library, and it doesn't matter which one, and you combine it with something else, like non-reactive library, or even worse, a synchronous library, like synchronous client to a database, you will run into some problems. So whenever you combine these words, whenever you have to cross these boundaries, you will have to make sure you got everything right. So this was sort of theory, and I have about eight minutes left. So let's write some code. And in those eight minutes, I'm going to write only in the slides, but fully working GraphQL gateway. So if I want to have a gateway, I first need a REST API to plug in. So I found this testing API called CatFacts. You've probably heard about that if you've ever done any testing. And this is a very simple API. You can try in your browser. It actually works. And it returns facts about cats, like the leopard is the most widespread of all big cats. But I didn't stop there. I was looking for another one just in case. And I found DogFacts API that does exactly the same thing for dogs. And yes, I could make a vote between dog facts and cat facts, but we only have a few minutes, so I just decided to use both and create an animal facts GraphQL API. This is not real URL, so please don't try. I want to have this query, and when I post this query to my, to my GraphQL gateway, I want to get back a dog fact and its length and a cat fact and its length. And it should look something like this. So I'm going to go to like a Spring initializer. I'm going to create a very simple Spring Boot application. I'm just going to select things like I want Kotlin because that's what I work with. And I want to use WebFlux so I get all the rest, um, the Reactive Streams APIs. And the only thing I actually have to add, because otherwise everything is generated for me, is this GraphQL Java dependency. If you've ever worked with Spring Boot, and I believe a lot of you did, uh, this is how the entry point to the application looks like. The Kotlin example has one advantage. It all fits on this slide, even with this large font. And this is going to be my GraphQL schema. It's a very simple query that allows me to query for cat facts and dog facts. And a fact is an object that has the actual fact and its length as an integer. These two things we have to call by thing we call a data fetcher, which is a thing for, um, that GraphQL Java wants me to provide. It's an interface. So the first interface is in Java. The second one is my interface, a fact fetcher that, I, that implements this data fetcher uh, that I'm implementing in Kotlin. One thing that uh, Kotlin has like a very nice feature is this data class. So we started writing our gateway with the schema, right? And I want to also have all those simple objects like facts that represent pieces of the schema. And in Kotlin, this is super simple because these data classes are exactly the POJOs that I need. So for example, this one is an immutable class. 
and Kotlin will generate a constructor, getters, a hash code, equals, and two string method for me. Cat fact fetcher, again, this code is very, very short. This is a Spring component. I'm using a reactive web client that's going to fetch the data from the API, which is represented by this cat fact. It's going to turn it into a mono, into my stream of 0 to 1 items, map it into my internal representation of a fact, and turn it into a future. Because the, here, I'm crossing the boundary from reactive streams to, to completable futures. A doc fact fetcher looks almost exactly the same, but because the API doesn't provide the length of the fact, I'm going to simply calculate it because it's so simple to add. A little bit of a configuration. It's, it's a little bit simplified, but if you actually use a GraphQL Java Spring Boot starters, you probably don't even have to do this. A wiring, that's an important part. I'm telling GraphQL Java, if you encounter dog in the query, please use dog fact fetcher. If you encounter cat, please use cat fact fetcher. A simple call to GraphQL Java. Again, this crossing the boundary but I'm going to turn it back into a mono at the end. And the last thing, this is also not 100% necessary because the, the Spring Boot starters can do this for you, but I want to show you how we create this GraphQL endpoint. The important part here is this line. So what GraphQL Java returns is a map of string to object or in Kotlin string to any. But this call to specification validates that, that response if it conforms or not to the schema. And that's, that's the very important part. All right, and if I execute my code and use that query in the beginning, I'm going to get a dog fact and a cat fact. And this is really just all the code that you need. And I have this example code for you um, in a Bitbucket repo. I will share the link later. And there is not much of other boilerplate code. This is really the code that you need for the simplest GraphQL gateway that you can write. It really doesn't take much. However, this gateway is not very good yet. And it's not good because it has absolutely no resilience. So I'm going to show you one example how we can improve it. Let's say that the CatFax API takes about 380 milliseconds to fetch a fact, and the DocFax API takes about 250. Thanks to the asynchronous nature of the app, this in total will take 380. But what happens if the CatFax API is broken? One of the options is that I'll get a timeout. And because we only use default values everywhere, it's going to be something like 30 seconds. And that's unacceptable, because then the whole thing takes 30 seconds. And the user will get a dog fact, a null cat fact, and an error message. And they can't really do anything with the cat fact and the error message. So what we can do is we can shorten the timeout. And, and that's a good idea, always. And in our code, it is actually as simple as this. In reality, again, it's not as simple because of different quirks of different clients like Netty. But let's say that it is as simple as this. And what the user will get, the same thing, a doc fact, a null cat fact, an error message. But it only took five seconds. But at this point, we already know that the cat facts API is broken. And we kind of don't really have to call it. So we will use a circle breaker, which is something that um, the colleagues in the previous talks were talking about. How this circuit breaker works? Well, it works similar to an electric circuit. If it's closed, it allows a signal to go through. So it allows to call the CatFax API. But what happens when, this, when the CatFax API is broken? Well, if I get enough errors to trigger my circuit, it will open, and it will not allow any more calls to the CatFax API. I'll specify a timeout after that I'm going to check again. This is called a half open state. Let's say it's just a few seconds. And because the CatFax API is still broken, I'm going to go back to open state. Well, at some point, I believe the CatFax API will be fixed. And when I trans uh, trans transition to half open state, I try again. CatFax API is working. I'm going to close my circuit and resume business as usual. In our fetcher, this is as simple as adding this line. This comes from a library called resilience for j You need to do a little setup, and getting these values right might be tricky, but it's not difficult. Um, difficult once you get it once right. So what will the user get? A dog fact, a cat fact that is, again, null, and an error message. However, 
this whole thing just to 250 milliseconds because we just didn't call the CatFax API at all. The only problem here is that we might have missed some of the cat facts, but to the user, how does it look like? It looks like that the cat facts API was broken maybe a few seconds longer. And that's just one of the examples how you can make your service more resilient. So I know this is a lot of a lot to take in in those 20 minutes, but even if you just forget everything I said, please try these things. If you have an application that waits a lot, it's IO heavy, try reactive streams. For APIs consumed from the front end, consider GraphQL, even if it's not a gateway, and definitely add some resilience um, to your applications. Now, I have a few resources for you. If you want to write exactly the same um, GraphQL gateway, if you want to get inspired, here is the link to a fully working demo. So this application has uh, both APIs plugged in. It works, you can just query it, and also it has some resilience, um, resilience examples. And it also has one trick that we used to cross the boundary between the project reactor and GraphQL Java, a little bit advanced that I didn't talk about in this presentation. Also a link to the library, GraphQL Java, another link to resilience for j which is the state of the art resilience library. And something that I didn't talk about, it's a tool called Graphical which is something like a Swagger for REST APIs. It's a tool that not only um, allows you to publish your documentation um, or the GraphQL schema along with your service, it also allows you to query uh, the GraphQL, um, GraphQL endpoint and, and test that your service is working. If you want to know more about how we build services at Atlassian, we have an engineering blog and we also have a new blog at Medium and if you want to know more about Microsoft, because I only mentioned it in the beginning, here is a slightly outdated but still very relevant talk from one of uh, the other Atlassians. If you were confused by that girl saying, why not both? I have a link uh, here for you as well. And um, we also hiring. So if you want to work on Java and Kotlin and reactive streams, you can join us. So this is it from me. I'm going to stop sharing my slides. Thank you, Martin. That was really Thank good. You. Into GraphGL, especially for someone like me who's not very familiar with GraphGL at all and probably live in the API world more. When when do you think you would recommend people um, start using GraphGL? Would you think that kind of um, take over the API world? So in Atlassian, we have this term that we like to use. It's called a API mullet, um, which means that you use the GraphQL in the front and then the rest in the back. So um, if you want to use it for um, service to service communication, I wouldn't recommend it, but I generally do recommend it for, for front end and for like a client facing APIs. Right. So we've got a question from Amri. Um, what is your experience with craft gel for object structures which don't map neatly to a single data source? Right, yeah. Okay. Um, well, GraphQL is a tree, right? It's a graph. So it might not, not, not neatly fit in a single data source, but you can create a common root and then you can just plug in two things under it. So I'm not sure if boards qualify, but in Jira software, board is a very complicated object, actually. It has a basic configuration like name, but it also has issues and it has a lot of other things. And you know, if you think about it from like an entity perspective, they don't really fit in that thing, but we still um, fit it into something a little bit bigger that has the actual board config and then all the other things. So that that's that's how we solve it. Yeah, I'm not sure if that answers your question. Great. So what, what do you think is some of the, the main challenges that you've seen or some of the problems that you have seen with the GraphQL gate? Um, so the actual problem that we had was that we have used Project Reactor and GraphQL Java. And the problem we had is that um, we very extensively use something called reactive uh, context. Or that's something like, um, it's a context that lives in the video stream and GraphQL Java doesn't have this concept. So when we cross the boundary 
from the reactive world to the non-reactive world, we lose this context. And we had to hack it a little bit, and we had to use a concept from GraphQL Java that is called data fetching environment, and basically take that context, serialize it in an object, put it in the data fetching environment, which is not supposed to be used for that, right? And then at the end, when the call returns to the reactive world, we had to like unpack it from, from the response and put it back in the context. So these kind of things were very tricky. Do you think it is still a bit relatively new um, for users in, in larger enterprise? Or do you think it's kind of now stable enough? Is enough libraries out there that can support GraphQL? Oh, well, I definitely recommend for, especially for larger enterprises to use GraphQL. For example, Atlassian is building its own big, bigger gateway and hopefully like bigger enterprises can plug their whole organization under one GraphQL API. Mm -hmm. I definitely stable enough. Mm. Uh, got another question from David. Would you say application backends can be replaced with GraphQL? For example, application backends that have some smarts instead of in the UI. I'm not sure if I understand this question. Application backends. Hmm. Other than just front end UI, do you recommend the backend code is also written as GraphQL? Well, we have some examples when another service is calling a GraphQL gateway. And that is simply because the GraphQL gateway does have some business logic that is useful for another service. But as I said, generally, I wouldn't recommend putting any logic into the gateway. Mm. So yeah, I, I wouldn't recommend it. You probably wouldn't want to build business logic using it. Like you can definitely put as much logic as you want. It's just that once you put the logic there, then you have to maintain it. And, and then you might have to live with that logic for a long time. And like in our case, when we use it for strength and monolith, we also had to put some logic there because there was no other place to put it. But right now we are in process of trying to move that business logic where it belongs, which is in the actual services. So Sorry. David, the, the, so the logic doesn't belong in a domain service, but in the front end specific like rules. Hmm. Right. So it's kind of like the, yeah, okay. <laughs> The <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah. Right, right, right. Great. Um, all right. I think um that's almost all the time we have today. That was really insightful. I really enjoy your talk. Thank you very much, Martin.